This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for attending today. According to the Infrastructure Department plan, Projected department expenses are going up by $2 billion in this fiscal year when compared to spending in 2022 and 2023. The, that would represent a 25% increase in planned spending from the year before. In addition, it would represent an increase of 75% in the department's budget from just three years ago. Uh, to put it in dollar figures, you are planning to drive up spending by $2 billion this fiscal year. And within three years, the department has increased its planned spending by $4.1 billion. That's a massive increase. And this increase is coming at a time when Canadians are struggling with groceries or struggling with bills. And it seems extremely disconnected from the Canadian public and out of touch with fiscal reality. So my question to you is, when everybody else is tightening up and Canadians are facing such financial financial stress. Do you think it's fair to plan a massive increase of your department spending in the sum of billions uh, which will increase the inflationary pressures on Canadians? So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, through you uh, to Dr. Lewis, thank you for the question. Uh, I certainly share your concern uh, about a fiscal responsibility about understanding that Canadians, as you said, are feeling uh, economic pressures in their family budgets, in their daily lives. I think it's important, and perhaps the deputy can add some detail to what I think is a basic principle. You're right, there has been an increase in the expenditures, but these are to a very, very considerable extent. The grants and contributions that our department is putting out is investing with partner governments and community organizations. So. Um, if it's a transit system. A lot of this is cash flow on a 10-year big transit project in certain fiscal years. Uh, certain amounts of money will be available and that would be reflected obviously in these detailed estimates. Um, I think your concern, and I would share that, is that these expenditures have to be on projects that benefit Canadians and their communities, that fight climate change, that improve transit. Um, and, and, and a very small percentage of that expenditure, of course, would be administrative or overhead. This uh, is money I'd like to speak about that, and we do have limited time. So with the $35 billion infrastructure bank, this bank has yet... Um, been unable to complete any projects. And the bank actually spent $24 million on employee salaries and bonuses and did not even spend half that amount on infrastructure projects. So how do you justify spending double the amount on employee salaries and bonuses rather than infrastructure projects? Uh, so, Mr. Chair, uh, the views of Dr. Lewis uh, on the Infrastructure Bank are well known. It won't surprise you or colleagues that I don't share her pessimism uh, with respect to the Infrastructure Bank. I think the Infrastructure Bank, and I've shared that with the board chair and the CEO, uh, has been in previous years slow to uh, ramp up and to be able to point to, for example, the 43 investment commitments uh, that they have made, 27 of which have reached final close. Uh, these are complicated financial transactions, uh, precisely why the government created the Infrastructure Bank. Um, I get that I've been an opposition MP too, Mr. Chair. It's easy to say that, oh, there have been no projects completed. And we can play with the word completed. I can tell you that premiers across the country, mayors including of some of the big cities in the country, uh, have talked to me about the importance of this financing vehicle. Yeah. I hope I'm not, colleagues I'm have not, taken I'm note. I'm not concerned with the importance. I'm not, I'm not um, disputing. Um, I'm disputing the efficacy of the bank, which this committee has already given notice to. This committee has recommended that the bank be abolished. And I'm wondering why you are not respecting the wishes of this committee that the bank be abolished because of its unproductive nature. That is not my conclusion. It is the conclusion of this committee. 
Well, it's not a conclusion that the government shares. We think the bank can be improved and strengthened. Uh, it shouldn't be abolished. We would disagree with that conclusion. That shouldn't su surprise anybody. In fact, in the budget that was tabled last month, uh, we indicated that we were giving a direction to the bank in terms of investing more in clean energy projects and in projects that would uh, allow Indigenous partners to take equity positions in large infrastructure projects. So we think there's a very useful and positive role for the bank, but we share some legitimate frustrations in terms of its ramp up. But the good news is we think that that's behind them. We share those frustrations because in 2021 and 2022, the bank managed to spend more on salaries and bonus, 35% more from the year before, while spending less on infrastructural programs. It is clear Clear that that by these numbers, that salaries and bonuses is the primary focus of this bank, and not the development of infrastructure for the benefit of taxpayers who are funding this bank. Again, uh, that's a slogan that you, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis, can use. I, I focus on the Canada Infrastructure Bank's approved investments of 8.6 billion dollars that have attracted 7.9 billion in private equity and institutional capital. Um, so at a time when the bank is ramping up to pursue the ambitious mandate that our government wants it to pursue, staffing costs have increased in a very modest amount compared to the uh, $8.6 billion. I'm, I'm going to ask for the last word on this. Unfortunately, because there's no time left. Um, you had stated that the infrastructural bank has spent modest salaries. So I'm just going to highlight some of these salaries. In 2020 and 21, spending for infrastructure programs was $25 million versus $17,742 17, uh, 17, on salaries. In 2021 to 2022, spending on infrastructure was just $11 million versus salaries of $24 million. In the same year, 2021 to 22, the bank's executives awarded themselves a 35% increase in salary and bonuses. Minister, why is this failed bank paying bonuses to underperforming executives? Mr. Chair, it won't surprise you. I don't uh, share the premise of the question. I just want to be very precise. The executives of the bank didn't award themselves those bonuses. Those would have been approved, of course, by the board of directors, uh, which is arm's length from the government. Uh, I think the numbers that Dr. Lewis was quoting are from the annual report of the bank. It's done in a transparent way. These are approved by a board of directors, and uh, the comparable metrics are similar private sector financial institutions. Uh, but we also recognize that the bank was ramping up as the number of investment decisions was increasing and as the equity and financing that was being made available to projects was going up. Uh, it's reasonable. It's reasonable accurate. that the staff should go up as well. Mi but Minister, in a that's not accurate. And reasonable way. M Minister, point in fact, order. from 2021, from point 2020 to 2021. Sorry, uh, Dr. Lewis, we have yes. a point of order from Ms. O'Connell. Mr. Chair, it's customary that when a question is asked, the uh, the witness has the <coughs> relatively equal amount of time to respond. <laughs> without, <laughs> excuse me, I have a point of order and have been recognized by the chair with the uh, with the floor, and I'd appreciate not being interrupted while I do so. Mr. Chair, my point of order is that for the sake of interpreters, it is incredibly difficult to receive interpretation when there is talking over the cha uh, over each other. If Dr. Lewis would like to take back her time, that's reasonable, but interrupting the minister or witnesses does not help our interpreters, and it is customary of this committee to allow the witness to respond in an equal amount of time. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Connell. I'll just ask uh, members and remind members to do their best to not to talk over the witnesses whenever possible. Uh, Dr. Lewis, you have three minutes, four seconds left on your time. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, we do have limited time, so I, I do uh, reserve my right to, to interrupt if, if the minister is going on too long. So, Minister, what exactly are the metrics that you use in judging whether or not the infrastructure bank is successful? Because I, I 
do want to make note that, in fact, in 2021, uh, you, uh, there was less invested in infrastructure than there was in 2022. So it wasn't a ramping up. It, in fact, there was double salaries paid in 2021 and 2022 than there was in infrastructural projects. So what are the metrics that you use, Minister? Uh, well, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, the metrics we use are uh, the investment decisions that the bank approved by its board make. Uh, and of course, we're happy to share with the committee uh, the detailed list of large projects and smaller ones in every part of the country where they have made an investment decision. Uh, many of these projects are multi-year projects. There are different moments in a particular project's planning where certain amounts of money would be booked by the bank. Uh, the good news is they're receiving more requests for financing and they are processing, i.e. approving investment decisions on an increasing basis. Um, and they are, of course, in terms of their own operating costs, uh, transparent and in our view reasonable as compared with other private sector financial institutions. But I would urge you, Mr. Chair, and I understand it may be in the coming days, the CEO of the Infrastructure Bank, Mr. Corey, and the board chair, uh, Madame Vrooman uh, are the ones that are best able to uh, uh, to talk to that. The good news, Mr. Chair, is uh, the deputy and I are meeting with them later this evening uh, as well. So I'll be happy to share Dr. Lewis's concerns with them and urge them to come to the committee if they're invited with very fulsome answers to that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I'm still very concerned that the single recommendation of this committee that this that the infrastructure bank be abolished is not something that you are you are uh, adhering to. Um, and by every metric, zero projects, uh, failing to leverage private sector investments, failing uh, in transparency, and by every single metric, the bank has missed the mark. Will you undertake to do an honest assessment of the performance and productivity and transparency of this bank in the five-year review, or are we just going to see an A-plus grade accorded to this bank? Again, Mr. Chair, it won't surprise you and some colleagues that I don't share Dr. Lewis's uh, pessimism uh, with respect to the bank. Uh, I share the concern I think that all of us had in terms of their ability to quickly ramp up and make money available uh, as a financial institution would for these important projects. Um, the good news also, uh, Mr. Chair, is as colleagues will know, there is a legislated review uh, of the bank that's currently underway. I've had an initial briefing from officials that have been involved in this. Uh, that will be part of the transparency. Dr. Lewis doesn't share that view. That's fine. Uh, we think the bank has been transparent as it should be. But so will the government be with this legislative review that's current legislated review which is currently underway. And my hope, Mr. Chair, is that we'll share it with Parliament before the end of June. And perhaps if I'm very lucky, you'll invite me back in the fall to talk about it. Thank